Uh, good afternoon. My name is M. Chernell Smith, and on behalf of the Center for Student Diversity and Inclusion, we want to welcome you to our long-awaited conversation with Dr. Carol Anderson. I know for myself, um, it's been uh, great uh, to see the conversations um, from this year's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. celebration for our university to be expanded uh, even more than we normally uh, have expanded the conversations. But I think in light of where we are in our world, that these are the types of conversations that should be continuously in our mind, in our hearts, and in our souls, but on the tongues of ourselves as we speak and talk and interact with one another. Dr. King stated that life's most per persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? And that is a question in which I would challenge you all to think about. I think that that is a question in which every day when you get up and you do your Headspace app to meditate, which has been a practice that I have established in my time here at Carnegie Mellon, that that's one of those questions that I ask myself. What am I doing for others? And when I think about an urgent and persistent narrative, Dr. Anderson's conversation today is truly a conversation in which we need to engage in as a Carnegie Mellon community, as a Pittsburgh community, and definitely one for our nation. At this time, I want to take a moment to introduce one of our student leaders, uh, John Bailey Jr., who's a senior, graduating senior, mechanical engineering student, who was, has been one of our conveners, our student conveners for our call to action uh, alliance. And it's important for John to be the person today to introduce our student speaker, because in many ways it's about carrying the torch forward. And in doing that, John Bailey has done that in helping to carry forth the messaging that Call to Action will continue to give and actually help our campus community create positive change, but also to help ourselves hold ourselves accountable to that question of, what are we doing for others? So at this time, I'm going to ask John Bailey to come forward. John is going to introduce our, our student remarks for to this afternoon. Following that, Dr. Joe Trotter, one of my mentors and one of the pillars of the Carnegie Mellon community, will come forward to introduce Dr. Anderson. And then at that time, it is all you, Dr. Anderson. <laughs> know that we will also have time for Q&A. And again, I thank you all for being in this space with me. I hope that you make a connection with someone new uh, in, in the audience today, because really it's about meaningful engagement. And that's one of the first steps toward the question of what are you doing for others? So at this time, I'm going to encourage John to come forward. I'm going to step aside. Finally, this will be my end of my MLK programming for 20, uh, the 2017 18 year. Uh, and you know what, Dr. Anderson, I think the timing is actually so correct. And so if it took a little bit, I'm happy that you're here healthy. <laughs> I'm happy that you're here healthy. Uh, but I'm very happy that you finally arrived here to our Carnegie Mellon community. Thanks again, John. It's yours. <laughs> All right. This thing on? Oh, bet. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Ms. Chanel said, my name is John Bailey Jr. I'm a graduating senior in mechanical engineering from Harlem, New York, and I have the distinct privilege of introducing our student remarks speaker, uh, Phoebe. Fung, or Phoebe, is an international first year PhD student in the psychology department at Carnegie Mellon University and goes by both the she and they pronoun series. She hails from Ho Chi Minh City, also known as Saigon, Vietnam, where motorcycles and the monsoon heat are the only constants in the quickly morphing landscape and mindscape of the city. She is a member of a student activist group on campus called Call to Action, a happy contributor to the diversity and inclusion newsletter of Dietrich College, which is called The Garden, so if you have a chance, please check that out. 
and can sometimes be spotted wandering in the direction of the Zebra Lounge of College of Fine Arts trying to get a cup of coffee. Everybody, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our student speaker, Phoebe. Thank you so much. It is an honor for me to be here with you this afternoon for Dr. Carol Anderson's keynote address. Since every great speech seems to begin with a story, and I have barely a few minutes up here, I'll just start with a really short one about how I ended up on this podium today. So a few weeks ago, Mr. Nell Smith at the Center for Student Diversity and Inclusion and I had a conversation, and it took her roughly five minutes to convince me that it was a good idea for me to share a few words here. Now, five minutes is the shortest amount of time anyone has taken in the past two years to convince me of anything substantive, including ice cream, so props to her. But I said yes before I realized I was panicking a lot. And a huge part of that panic comes from just my fear of public speaking. I mean, what do I say when I stand behind a podium like this in front of an audience like you? And the other part of that panic comes from me realizing just the gravity of having this platform. Because really, does a queer international student from Vietnam have anything, anything to do with the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a civil rights leader, an American Baptist minister, and a political activist? As you're about to find out, the answer to this question is one that abounds with irony. So let's see, what kinds of irony have I discovered on my way to this podium? For one, when I came to the United States to pursue my undergraduate education, I had to fill out a form at the beginning of the year to choose my roommate, and through the ethnicity item on that form, we discovered that I am, in fact, Asian. <laughs> Funny, I know, okay, I know, <laughs> but you know, there was some discomfort in that, in that rediscovery, and I didn't know why. I was there back then, but I know now. And it is because the label Asian seems just a little bit too loose, too large for my Vietnamese history and heritage. And ironically, the narratives of ethnic homogeneity and unity in Vietnam left me no room and put a veil over my Vietnamese history and identity until I was a fish out of the water. And so slowly I had to reconstruct my understanding of what it means to be a Vietnamese while living and breathing in American politics. And so as I did that, I got to know a little bit better about the model minority myth in which certain groups of immigrants, often East Asians, are deemed the good kind of immigrants and the gold standard by which other groups should strive. I learned that through tactics such as the model minority myth, the state has had a long history of pitching oppressed groups of all stripes against one another so they cannot unite against the different forms of injustice inflicted upon them. I learned of the historical perspective of the United States on the American war in Vietnam. And I now know that as it tore my country into two, it also ripped the political fabric of this empire apart. I learned about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s seminal speech at the March on Washington, where he dreamed loudly and proudly a collective dream of many black people, and if I may add, other people of color too, toward desegregation, dignity, and equity. At some point, I began to suspect that these realizations should not, and need not, be restricted within the bounds of American history and politics. The 2016 American presidential election was but part of a rising wave of global authoritarianism that actually hits quite close to my home. The atrocities of police brutality in the United States mirror the kind of state violence towards Palestinian youths such as Ahad Tamimi. And here lies my biggest realization of an irony, that all of the facets of my identity even the ones that I have yet to realize, are political. That identities are political even if the baggage attached differ from context to context. Thus far, I've spent one third of my life outside of my birth country. Before Carnegie Mellon, I received my undergraduate education in the Boston area. 
And before that, I was on a scholarship for high school in Singapore. Floating around makes it difficult to grow roots. And today I'm still learning to graft myself better into the community around me. At Carnegie Mellon, I'm part of Call to Action, a student group whose aim is to amplify the voices of underrepresented and underserved individuals and groups at CMU to bring about social justice and positive change. I am fortunate enough that many graduate students in my home department, the psychology department, are passionate about reaching out to and sharing knowledge with students in the greater Pittsburgh area and have been able to join them in some of their outreach efforts. The past seven months have been a whirlwind, and I don't think that the next four years will slow down for me in any way. But maybe that's what it should be. For if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So that was a long detour. But you know, to return to the original question of whether I have anything to do with the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The answer, as you may have expected, is a yes. Yes, insofar as I should not deem myself an external party to the community in which I am embedded, insofar as my words still carry weight for the people with whom I speak, and my inaction in the face of injustice, regardless of what form it takes or where it takes place, screens complicity. Insofar as being woke, is neither an end goal nor a title to claim for social currency, but a difficult and, con and continuing process and that I cannot do this alone. In so far as the fight for justice is a global battle, never ending, ever urgent. In so far as six days shy of 52 years ago, Dr. King led a demonstration of 5,000 protesters in Chicago to decry the American war in Vietnam. So may I end with a quote from Dr. King's speech, Beyond Vietnam. Now let us begin. Now let us rededicate ourselves to the long and bitter, but beautiful struggle for a new world. This is the calling of the sons of God, and our brothers wait eagerly for our response. Shall we say the odds are too great? Shall we tell them the struggle is too hard? Will our message be that the forces of American life militate against their arrival as full men, and we send our deepest regrets? Or will there be another message of longing, of hope, of solidarity with their yearnings, of commitment to their cause, whatever the cost? The choice is ours, and though we might prefer it otherwise, we must choose in this crucial moment of human history. Thank you for opening your heart and mind to me today in this auditorium. In memory of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I conclude my piece. Thank you. Wow, that's amazing. I am really happy to see how the students are involved in this initiative, in this effort. Uh, but I must say it is a pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor Carol Anderson. But this is not the first time that Carol has presented at Carnegie Mellon. It's not even the second time. This is the third time that Carol is presenting at Carnegie Mellon, and I might say that, uh, be careful, because we might make you our own, okay? <laughs> she came here in 1911 and again in 1915, and now 1918. <laughs> Carol, Carol. <laughs> Oh, okay, I'll put a 20 on it. Okay, 20. <laughs> I hate to say that I, I, I flash back, okay, to the 20th century. <laughs> okay, then 2011 and 2015, how's that? Okay, let me get on with it, okay? 
Um, Furon is the Howard Candler Professor of African American Studies at Emory University in Atlanta. Her scholarship and teaching focus on the impact of public policy on patterns of race, social justice, and inequality in African American and U.S. history. In addition to numerous scholarly essays and articles, she is the author of three groundbreaking books. Her first book, Eyes Off the Prize, published by Cambridge University Press, this book examined the African-American struggle for human rights, not just civil rights, but human rights, in the years after World War II. As off the prize, won both the Gustavus, Meyer, and Myrner Burnett Book Awards for excellence in scholarship. She is also the author of a second book titled Bourgeois Radicals, published by Cambridge University Press as well. This book builds upon the immense contributions of her first book. Bourgeois Radicals documents the extensive role of the NAACP in the liberation movements of both Africa and Asia. But perhaps most important for us today and this evening, for understanding race, class, and social justice issues in our times, Dr. Anderson is the author of the best-selling book, White Rage, The Unspoken Truth of Our Racial Divide. Published by Bloomberg Press in 2016, White Rage arrived at just the right time to help us understand the roots of racial conflict in American society in the 21st century. Accolades for white rage have come in. They include the New York Times bestseller on race and civil rights, the one, number one bestseller on Amazon discrimination and constitutional law studies list, and the New York Times editors pick for July 2016. But her awards do not stop there. Professor Anderson's other awards include a variety of research fellowships from such organizations as the National Humanities Center, Harvard's Charles Warren Center for Studies in American History, and most recently, the Posen Chair in Human Rights at the University of Chicago, I believe to be taken up in 2019. Professor Anderson is not only an outstanding researcher and writer, she is also an excellent teacher and an engaging public intellectual. Her teaching awards are over a half dozen that I counted on her CV. And in conjunction with other awards, with other scholars, they escalate. Professor Anderson received her undergraduate degree and her MA degree from the University of Miami in Ohio, where she graduated Phi Beta Kappa. She, served, she, she um, uh, earned her PhD degree in history from the Ohio State University. Her CV is long, and I will not delay her appearance any longer. So let us welcome Professor Carol Anderson. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much for being here on a Thursday, because I know there's things to do on a Thursday in Pittsburgh. <laughs> Because as Joe has said, I've been here a minute. <laughs> but what I, and so I wanted to thank 
the Diversity Initiative for inviting me. I want to thank Joe. I want to thank Carnegie Mellon because this is my second home. I've been here so long. <laughs> uh, but what I wanted to do was to talk about how this black woman got to white rage. Mm. And it started in February 1999. A black man had been working hard all day. And he came home and he was hungry. You know that feeling when you've been working hard all day and you just want something to eat? You look in the refrigerator and it's looking back at you. <laughs> and, and so there's nothing in that refrigerator that he wanted. And so he, he's like, ah, I'm going to go get something to eat. But you know what? I'm in New York City, the city that never sleeps. I'm going to go get me something to eat. And so Amadou Diallo. Mm. stepped out on his front porch just to go get something to eat. A car came up, four police officers of the NYPD hopped out, guns drawn, and they started firing. 41 bullets later, Amadou Diallo went down. 19 of those bullets hit him. Amadou was unarmed. When you talk to the police officers, they were like, um, see, um, like we, um, we uh, were looking for a serial rapist. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Well, did he look like, well, no. And so then they went hunting for something on Amadou. And there was nothing. No criminal record. No warrants. Nothing that would justify 41 bullets. That was bad enough. But then there was Mayor Rudy Giuliani. Oh, oh I can tell this. We don't have church up in here today. <laughs> Woo, that was some sweet call and response. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there was Rudy Giuliani. And he's being interviewed by Ted Koppel on ABC's Nightline. And Ted Koppel is no softball interviewer. Ted Koppel comes at you hard. Ted Koppel doesn't lay up. And Ted Koppel was like, Amadou, Amadou, Amadou. Rudy's not flinching. Rudy says, my policies are working. New York City is safer than it has been in years. And I'm like, it wasn't safe for Amadou. Safer for whom? And he said, my policies are working. Now, those policies that he talked about, that was broken windows policing. And broken windows policing was a theory that if what you did was you hyper-policed a neighborhood, so you litter, cops are on you. You jaywalk, cops are on you. That that hyper-policing, but you get this hyper-policing in black and brown neighborhoods, which means you get the criminalization of black and brown people. That criminalization was the policy that he said was working. And as he told Ted Koppel, not only are my policies working, but my police force is the best behaved and the most restrained in America. Now, that's where I went into Kafka. <laughs> you know, because if Gregor Samsa can be a cockroach, then we know that a police force that can put 41 bullets into an unarmed man can be the most restrained and best behaved. You know you're looking at a flip of the language that makes no sense. Because I was sitting there, Rrr. but I couldn't put, my put a name on it. You know, what do I call this thing? All I know is that something's not right. That's all I knew, something's not right, but there's something that's happening here. And so as a scholar, I keep writing, I keep researching, I keep teaching, I keep writing, I keep researching, I keep teaching. And then August 2014 happens. I'm in my home office, I've got the TV on, and all of a sudden I see Ferguson, Missouri in flames. And it didn't matter 
what station I had on, because I, I had the remote in my hand and I'm doing this, whether I was listening, this on my left hand, whether I'm listening to MSNBC, CNN, or Fox. It didn't matter. They were all saying the same thing. Ooh, look at black folks burning up where they live. Can you believe that black people are burning up where they live? Did you see those black people burning up where, ooh, what is wrong with black people? Because America needs the narrative of black pathology. That there's just something, you know, America would be all right if black folks would just, and then you fill in the blank. Right? They just valued school, valued education like everybody else does. As you talked about the model minorities, right? If they would just vote, if they would just take care of their kids. How am I doing so far? Anybody hear any of this? Mm -hmm. In that narrative of black pathology, as they're talking about this black rage, I found myself shaking my head. Like, that's not black rage, that's white rage. Ooh. <laughs> Whoa. I was like, and, and I was in a, 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 a program called the Op Ed Project. So I started writing white rage. This is white rage. Except I didn't type quite like that. <laughs> But as I'm going through this, laying out how white rage works, what begins to hit me initially is that as a nation, we are so focused in on the flames that we've missed the kindling. Kindling, yes. I knew this was church. Kindling. I lived in Missouri for 13 years, taught at the University of Missouri, Columbia. And I saw how that state worked, kindling. In Ferguson, the population is about 67% African American. In 2013, in the municipal election, the black voter turnout rate was 6%. How do you turn 67% of the population into 6% of the voters. Kindling. Policies that begin to manipulate African Americans' access to their basic citizenship rights. Kindling. Or let's take the education. Michael Brown came out of a school system, the Ferguson schools. Missouri has this accreditation system where you can earn up to 140 points for school systems. That's how you're accredited. Graduation rates, matriculation rates, standardized test scores. You, you know the kind of the usual suspects. 140. How many points do you think that Michael Brown school system got? 60? 50? Okay, we got a 50 over here. That's a good, good one. Anybody else? 20? Was there a 20? Did somebody, somebody fix their mouth to say 20? <laughs> You're like, no, I'm not saying it now. <laughs> so we got 50, we've got 20 somewhere up in here. 60? 60? Teen. Did you say 60? Okay. okay. 50, 60, 14. For 15 years. Begin to think about what that looks like in a school system where we are sending black children through a school system 
that cannot even garner enough points to get up to failing. And not only did we do it for one year, but we had folks on the school board and in school administration who were really cool with a school system that took an entire generation of black children through from K through 12. And wasn't satisfied then, but then took yet another group, because we were talking about 15 years. So we've got another group of children coming through that system that systematically and systemically does not work. And the state kept accrediting it, provisional accreditation. Provisional accreditation, provisional accreditation, kindling. Or, let's talk about the police. We know that the police are here to serve and protect. Serve and protect. That sounds so good, doesn't it? And you know what I love is that we know this. It's like it's in the air. It's like our hymn book, right? It's like, well, we don't even have to turn to, you know, hymn number 49. Because we just pick it up and we say the police are here to serve and protect. Not in Ferguson. The Ferguson police looked at that black population as revenue generators. Ooh, you look like you were doing 26 and a 25. Ticket. I don't really recall you putting on your turn signal. Ticket. Did you change lanes without signaling? Ticket. Oh, that looks like a busted tail light. Ticket. And the ticketing on this black population was so intense because we are talking about a working class population. So when you get hit with a series of $50 and $100 tickets, I mean, you're figuring out whether you're going to pay the ticket or whether you're going to pay the rent. You're figuring out whether you're going to put food on the table or pay the ticket. You know, when you're thinking about choices, you're thinking, I've got to keep the roof over the head. I've got to keep food on the table. I've got to keep the heat on. I've got to keep the water on. Well, the next time you get pulled over for doing 26 and a 25 and you haven't paid that ticket, there is a warrant out for your arrest. So now you got black folks arrested and then having to pay all of the fines and the court costs that go with that. It was so intense that those fines generated 25% of the city's operating revenue. Yes, <laughs> that would be a two five. <laughs> You know I got no sense. <laughs> <laughs> but worse than that, because you know, we still like to think justice is blind. Well, I got some cynics in here too. <laughs> but the way that it would work is if a police officer pulled over someone white, it would be, oops, sorry, you can go. Or if the officer happened to give the ticket, when the white person went to go pay the ticket, you don't have to pay that and would tear it up. So you have justice operating in Ferguson, Missouri in the 21st century that is openly, blatantly racially discriminatory and predatory. Kindling. And so as I began to think through the way that white rage worked, it, was so, it became so clear to me that it was working its way subtly, corrosively, quietly, legally, through the courts, through school boards, through the legislature, that it was working so smoothly that we couldn't see it. So I set out to blow graphite on that fingerprint of white rage and track it over history, because I am a historian, and to see how this thing moved. One of the things that became clear to me was that it's not the presence of black people that triggers white rage. 
That's, that's almost like, what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> it's the presence of black people with ambition. It is the presence, it is the presence of black people who achieve, who aspire. Yeah. <laughs> it is the black, presence of black people who refuse to accept their subjugation and black people who demand their rights. It is in that action that is the trigger for white rage. But I've got to tell you, that sounds counterintuitive. Because in America, this is the land of opportunity, where all you have to do is work hard. Work hard. I'm telling you, we're in that hymnal, aren't we? Yeah. You got to work hard, keep your nose clean, go to school, and you too can have the American dream. Mm -hmm. right? So, and I mean, so this is why this is counterintuitive. Because how many times have you heard, if black folks would only? So how is it that white rage is the trigger for black folks who are doing only? Except then, how do you explain? how government after government after government has systematically denied black children the right to an education. Black parents have been fighting hard for centuries to gain access to quality education for their children, only to be rebuffed, kicked, denied. Let me give you a couple of examples. In 1947, this would be after the U.S. had helped defeat the Nazis. In Prince Edward County, Virginia, they had finally built, finally built, a high school for black kids. Because, you know, we're in Jim Crow schools. So finally, a high school for black kids, 1947. By 1951, that school is bursting at the seams. It's got so many children. You got kids on top of kids in there. And have you been in classrooms where you're on top of each other? The learning stops. Because all you're thinking of, he's on top of me. And so the parents went to the school board and said, our babies are on top of each other. This is not a quality learning environment. We pay taxes, too. Our babies deserve quality education. School board said, no. And the parents kept coming. They would not give up. Finally, the school board relents and puts up three tar paper shacks. It says, there, that's where your kids can go. Into the tar paper shacks. Meanwhile, the white schools are made of bricks with indoor plumbing. Barbara John, 17-year-old, Barbara Johns was an organizer. Barbara Johns was like, oh, not today. My name would be the wrong one. And so she started talking to her classmates. You believe this mess? Tar, paper. What are we gonna do about it? What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? And you know that kind of conversation. What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? And all of a sudden you start hearing, what are we gonna do? What are we going to do? I know what we're going to do. We're going to walk on out of here. We're going to protest this mess. And so protest they did. She organized a mass walkout of the Moton High School. Administrators and teachers were like, oh. and she was like, yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, is that death threats started raining down on her. This 17-year-old child who just wants to be educated. Her parents had to sneak her out of Virginia to safety in Alabama. No. I'm telling you, Lord, when you got to go to Alabama for safety. <laughs> This is some real deal stuff, right? 
I'm going to Alabama to be free. <laughs> but Prince Edward County wasn't through because the black parents and children kept pushing, demanding quality education. And so Prince Edward County, when the Brown decision came through, Prince Edward County said, oh, I got something real for you. We're going to shut down the entire school system. Yeah. Because I are smart. <laughs> <laughs> now, what, why they did that, because I see the furrowed brow there. It's like, Whoa. why they did that? Because if the Supreme Court is saying that the schools have to be equal, Right. If you don't have a public school system, then it is equal for black and white children alike. But she's got that look, she's got the hand over the mouth like, where am I? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to America. <laughs> and so, but you know, white parents aren't having that. You know, the school board can ignore black parents. But white parents, they're used to juice. They're used to clout. They're used to being heard. And, and the school board and the state legislators, don't, don't worry, we, we, we got you. We got you. And so what they set up was a private tuition voucher system paid for out of the state so that white children could go to all white private academies and continue their education. There was nothing available. Now understand, black parents are paying taxes. So black parents are paying for white children to go to all white private academies paid for by the state when there is nothing available for their children. Prince Edward County was closed five years. It took a couple of Supreme Court decisions to finally open that thing up. But imagine, your school shuts down when you are in the fifth grade. It doesn't open up again until you're in the 10th. What have you lost? And this is happening just at that moment where the US economy is turning from a manufacturing-based economy to a knowledge-based, technology-driven economy. And we have thousands upon thousands of black folks just out of Prince Edward County who cannot be in that economy. Schools were shut down in other places throughout the South. And let's think about this. So when Brown came down in 54 and then the Brown decision, Brown 2, with all deliberate speed in 55, 100 members of Congress, about 101 members of Congress, signed a manifesto promising massive resistance to Brown. So you have US senators and US congressmen vowing to do everything in their power to undermine the law of the land. But in 1957, all of a sudden there was this sound. Beep, beep, beep. See, this is the beauty of being at Carnegie Mellon. Y'all already know what that is. <laughs> and with that beep, you heard Eisenhower, President Eisenhower going, dang, dang, <laughs> dang. <laughs> because that was Sputnik. The Soviets had launched a satellite, and what that meant, them having the technological ability to get that thing up in orbit, it now meant that their nuclear arsenal, because the US had gotten a little swag on, yeah, they got nukes, but they can't get to us, like they can get across the Pacific, or like they can get across the Atlantic. Beep, beep, <laughs> this, Eisenhower starts talking about a national security crisis. We need to have the brain power to fight the Cold War. We need to train enough scientists and engineers so that the US will continue to have the technological ability and superiority 
to counter whatever the Soviets do. This is the time when the federal government is talking about putting, via the National Defense Education Act, hundreds of millions of dollars pouring in to colleges and universities. This is landmark. This is huge. Well, this bill, as it's working its way through Congress, is being shepherded by the senator and the congressman from Alabama. And they love the scent of that hundreds of millions of dollars and thinking about what that could mean for Bama. Mm. But there was this little problem called Brown because they had dug in with massive resistance. And so they're talking to the Eisenhower administration. Now, we can shepherd this bill through, but we, we just want to make sure that we can continue to have access to those hundreds of millions of dollars as long as we continue to defy Brown and keep Alabama and Old Miss and the University of Georgia and all of them whites only admissions. And the Eisenhower administration said, yes, that's all right. You will not find any pressure from us to uphold the law of the land. Now begin to think about what that means, where I'm like, okay, so we've got national security crisis, Jim Crow. Nuclear annihilation, Jim Crow. Nuclear annihilation, Jim Crow. Except in this matrix of decision making, Jim Crow. Think about the millions. Anybody see hidden figures? Yeah. Yeah, think about in this moment of counterfactual history. Yeah, yeah, right? Think about what this nation could have been if we had opened up those opportunities, opened up all of those resources, all of those labs, all of that computing equipment. But instead, whites only. And we live with the legacy of that to this very day. I'm going to take another one. War on drugs. Mm -hmm. There goes that church thing again. Now, one of the ways that white rage works is that it sounds logical. Remember, this is cloaked in legislatures and judges, and, and so the war, we've got to keep our communities safe. You know, we've got to keep our communities safe. We've got to protect our children from the scourge of drugs. It sounds logical, except African Americans do some category of drugs, like marijuana, at about the same rate as whites, and cocaine at a much lower rate. So how is it then in this war on drugs to protect our communities from the scourge that we have incarcerated most those who do drugs the least? We have waged war on those who are doing it the least. Yeah, that's one of those uh, moments. I call them the Scooby-Doo moments. <laughs> uh, uh, shaggy. <laughs> and to put this another way, the U.S. has spent about $1 trillion on the war on drugs to incarcerate most those who do drugs the least and begin to think about what one trillion can mean. One trillion for our infrastructure. Ooh. One trillion to keep tuition low. Mm. Oh yeah, y'all can sing it now. <laughs> y'all y'all feeling it now. Yeah, well, every time you write that check, mm-hmm. But imagine 
if I, I worked in Ohio at the Ohio Board of Regents for a while, over a decade, and one of our things was trying to get tuition low by having state subsidy at a high enough rate so that the students wouldn't have to pay so much. Because you can do it if you, if you alloc reallocate your resources. Instead, what was happening, we have destabilized state budgets by mass incarceration. We have destabilized black communities via mass incarceration. We have destabilized families via mass incarceration. We have destabilized democracy. I'll give you an example. Florida. Now my students laugh because like when we're talking about the uh, compromise of 1877, it was because Florida couldn't figure out how to count. <laughs> then when we get to the election of 2000, Florida couldn't figure out how to, and they're like, still? <laughs> or as they say in the South, bless their hearts. <laughs> and Florida has massive felony disfranchisement. If you have a felony conviction, you cannot vote in Florida. And it's permanent. Well, almost permanent. There is an entire process you have to go through in order to get your voting rights back after you have served your sentence and your parole. After all of the terms of your sentence are done, then you have to wait 14 years to individually petition the governor to ask him to grant you your voting rights back. What this means in Florida, and when I say felony conviction, I do mean the standard stuff, but, fe but Florida also has things like letting a helium balloon go up in the air or walking through a construction site. And I'm like, Lord help you if you let a helium balloon go up in the air while you were walking through a construction <laughs> site. <laughs> and so what happens then is that in Florida, 40% of black, adult black men cannot vote. 40%. Overall, it's about 23 to 25% of African Americans cannot vote in Florida. Now begin to think about what that looks like because you know Florida counts those bodies in the census when it is figuring out how many representatives it's going to get in Congress. I know this is looking like the three-fifths clause to me. Where you can count those bodies but they have absolutely no say, no vote. Yeah. Speaking of the vote, how many of you heard after the 2016 election, well, you know, black folks didn't just, show, they just didn't show up. You know, they just weren't filling Hillary. Come on, raise that hand, you know you heard it. That's right. Well, they just didn't show up. This was the first election in 50 years without the protection of the Voting Rights Act. Let me explain how that happened. In 2008, Barack Obama became president of the United States. A black man in the White House? Okay, how many of y'all went, whoa? <laughs> I know, I looked up and said, mommy, you believe this? Right? It was just one of those, what, whoa. But how it happened, was an incredible ground game. Massive organizing, getting out the vote. In 2008, 15 million new voters showed up at the polls. Wow. Now, generally, what we say is we love a vibrant democracy. Y'all got some cynics here at Carnegie Mellon. <laughs> I'm just telling you. <laughs> over there, over there in that corner, right over there. <laughs> we say we love democracy, we, and we think about what it means when you have people invested in democracy. It works. When you have people who are alienated, who feel they have no stake, 
And let's talk about the demographics of that 15 million. Two million new African American voters came to the polls in 2008. Two million black folk who had not voted before. Two million new Hispanic voters who had not voted before. 600,000 new Asian American voters. And almost doubling the percentage of people who made less than $15,000 a year. So you've got black folk, you've got brown folk, you've got Asians, and you have got the poor. Now this is a demographic that is saying, I see something valuable in America, and I am going to participate civically. We should be applauding this, right? This is great. Over in the dark bowels. In, let me start off with, in 2013, the Supreme Court in Shelby County v. Holder gutted the Voting Rights Act. John Roberts, in his decision, said that it was basically um, an artifact of a bygone era, that racism no longer really existed like that in America that it was punitive and that it unduly picked on the South, that um, it was basically calcified because many of the jurisdictions that were under the, the pre-clearance uh, doctrine where if you were going to change anything in your voting regulations, your voting rules, it had to be okayed by the Department of Justice, pre-clearance, that any of the districts that were there Many of them are still there. So it shows that this thing is calcified. And I'm like, mm, it shows that the folks who were acting a fool in 1965 are acting a fool in 2013. Because the Voting Rights Act had stopped over 700 changes that these districts had tried to make to their voting rights. 700. With the gutting of the Voting Rights Act, now that these districts don't have to get pre-cleared to be able to change whatever they want to change, they hit it hard. Let's take Alabama. Remember where Barbara Johns ran for safety? In Alabama in 2011, which is actually two years before the Shelby County v. Holder decision, Alabama passed a voter ID law saying you have to have government issued photo ID in order to vote. Now, the Republicans taped themselves, I don't know, somehow, talking. And what they said was, we have got to figure out how to decrease the black voter turnout. <laughs> and, because you know, they can't help themselves. Because these illiterates and these aborigines will get on these HUD finance buses to the polls as they're crafting the law. So I'm thinking this law can't get through the pre-clearance of the DOJ. But after the Voting Rights Act gets gutted, boom, Alabama immediately implements that law. Now, in doing so, it is identifying what types of government-issued photo ID. Because, see, part of the way that white rage works is it looks logical. And so I've had folks say, well, you know, I mean, I've got I've to have an ID to check out a library book. How hard can it be to get an ID? Anybody hear that before? Mm -hmm. OK, so let's talk about Alabama. So in Alabama, Alabama is somewhere between the 47th and the 48th poorest state in the nation. Alabama's poor. 
it has a lot of public housing because Alabama is poor. 71% of those in public housing are African Americans. Alabama decided that public housing ID would not count as government issued photo ID for voting. Now I'm thinking it doesn't get more government issued than public housing. <laughs> but what you can see in that decision about what types of ID is that you can begin to start shaping the demographic of the electorate. You can begin to target the, that coalition that put Obama into the White House. What the governor then did was he shut down the Department of Motor Vehicles in the Black Belt counties. Now, he did this because, and this is some, his mistress, was, and this is some crazy pillow talk. Yo, baby, you know what I think you ought to do? Shut down the Department of Motor, oh yeah, baby. And that's what he, I mean, that's all y'all got to talk about. But that's what happened. I mean, it, you can't make this stuff up. Her name is Rebecca, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and so, in shutting down the Department of Motor Vehicles in the Black Belt counties, and the Black Belt counties are those counties in Alabama, it originally was supposed to be about the soil, but those are the counties that have large, somewhere between 30 to 40 to up to 70 percent of their population is African American. Those are the Black Belt counties shut down the DMVs for fiscal reasons. Now, what happens then is that 15% of African Americans in Alabama do not have a driver's license. 4% of whites do not. And it's really logical. Cars are expensive. You got the note, you got the gas, you got the insurance, you've got the maintenance, and you got parking. When you're paying for a car and you're on, because in the Black Belt counties, at least 25% of the population lives below the poverty rate. In some counties, it's up to 40%. You are making keen choices about how you are spending your very limited dollars. When there's not a Department of Motor Vehicles in your county, how do you get the card that you need in order to vote in your county? And you don't have public transportation. Alabama ranks 48th in the nation in public transportation. Because you can't drive there because you don't have a car, you don't have a driver's license. So what you have basically essentially set up is a mass of voters who don't have access to their basic right to vote because of the want of a card. Now, what we also hear in this is voter fraud. Voter fraud, and how many have heard about voter fraud? Yeah. Again, this is the mask. Justin Levitt, a law professor in California, did a study from 2000 to 2014 or 15 to identify how many cases of voter identification fraud had in fact happened out of one billion votes, he found 31 cases. <laughs> this is what I'm saying, right? <laughs> 31, 31. This is the massive voter fraud that has, put, that has put the fig leaf over what is happening with all of these voter suppression laws that get Americans to believe that this is about protecting democracy, protecting the electoral integrity of the ballot box, when in fact what it is about is suppressing the rights of American citizens. Let's take Texas. I mean, I mean, you're like, take it. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Dang, y'all. 
<laughs> First, let me hit Wisconsin quickly because I want to get into the craziness of these government issued photo IDs. Up until the spring of 2016, Wisconsin would not allow military IDs as a government issued photo ID to vote. Now, if public housing is like government issued, I'm here to tell you, being part of the military, you are government issued. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, I come from, my, daddy was career military, army. I get government issued. But Wisconsin denied the right to vote to members of the armed forces that were, that was the ID that they had until it got too difficult to wear that little flag lapel pin and talk about we're denying soldiers the right to vote. That was 2016. Texas, you knew we were gonna get there. Texas, within two hours of Shelby County v. Holder, Texas passed SB 14 their voter ID law. In their voter ID law, they identified the types of IDs that counted, and of course, everything else didn't. So student IDs did not count. So government issued, but you're at the University of Texas, Austin. You would be, that would be a state-funded school. Your government issued photo ID would not count, but your gun registration permit would. <laughs> I'll tell you, this is a great audience. <laughs> Because you can see how selecting the types of ID begin to shape who the electorate is, who has access to the ballot box. And only one third of the counties in Texas actually have a Department of Motor Vehicles. Now, Texas did its analysis and figured out something like 1.6 million of its residents would need to drive 125 miles to get to the nearest Department of Motor Vehicles and then another 125 miles to get back. So that's a 250 mile round trip, but you know you can't drive because you don't have a driver's license. <laughs> I'm just saying. And, and so in the original bill, there was language about reimbursement for that 250 mile round trip. Before the bill passed, they drew a line through the reimbursement. So that 250 mile round trip is on you. This looks like a poll tax. It is a way to suppress the vote. And so when you hear, well, black folks just didn't show up. The black voter turnout rate in 2016 because of massive voter suppression. Wisconsin, North Carolina, Texas, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Alabama, Michigan. This isn't a southern thing. Declined by 7%. Declined by 7%. Voter suppression put Trump in the White House. We need to understand that. And all of this was done. All of it. What's happening in our schools, what's happening in our criminal justice system, what's happening with our, uh, our voting rights, all of this was done without a Klan cross burning. It was done coolly, methodically, systematically in state houses. in the Supreme Court. This is white rage. And so what I want to do right now is just read you a couple of passages and then open it up for Q&A. Okay. And now I got to put my glasses on because I'm no longer 25. This one comes from the War on Drugs, where I start off talking about um, 
um, laying out Michelle Alexander's uh, analysis of the Supreme Court decisions that embedded racism in the operating code of the law dealing with the war on drugs. Taken together, those rulings allowed, indeed encouraged, the criminal justice system to run racially amok. And that's exactly what happened on July 23, 1999, in Tulia, Texas. In the dead of night, local police launched a massive raid and busted a major cocaine trafficking ring. At least that's how it was billed by the local media, which, after having been tipped off, lined up to get the best, most humiliating photographs of 46 of the town's 5,000 residents handcuffed in pajamas, underwear, and uncombed bed hair, being paraded into jail for booking. The local newspaper, the Tulia Sentinel, ran the headline, Tulia Streets Cleared of Garbage. The editorial praised law enforcement for ridding Tulia of drug-dealing scumbags. The raid was the result of an 18-month investigation by a man who would be named by Texas's Attorney General as Outstanding Lawman of the Year. Tom Coleman didn't lead a team of investigators. Instead, he single-handedly identified each member of this massive cocaine operation and made more than 100 undercover drug purchases. He was hailed as a hero. And his testimony immediately led to 38 of the 46 being convicted, with the other cases just waiting to get into the clogged court system. Joe Moore, a pig farmer, was sentenced to 99 years for selling $200 worth of cocaine. Kizzy White received 25 years, while her husband, William Cash Love, landed 434 years for possessing an ounce of cocaine. The case began to unravel, however, when Kizzy's sister Tanya went to trial. Coleman swore that she had sold him drugs. Tanya, however, had video proof that she was at a bank in Oklahoma City, 300 miles away, cashing a check at the very moment he claimed to have bought cocaine from her. Mm. Then another defendant, Billy Don Wafer, had timesheets and his boss's eyewitness testimony that Wafer was at work and not out selling drugs to Coleman. And when the outstanding lawman of the year swore under oath that he had purchased cocaine from Yule Bryant, a tall, bushy-haired man, only to have Bryant, bald and five foot six, <laughs> appear in court, <laughs> it finally became very clear that something was awry. Coleman, in fact, had no proof whatsoever that any of the alleged drug deals had taken place. There were no audio tapes, no photographs, no witnesses, no other police officers present, no fingerprints but his on the bags of drugs, no records. Over the span of an 18-month investigation, he never wore a wire. Now, he claimed to have written each drug transaction on his leg. <laughs> but to have washed away the evidence when he showered. <laughs> okay, so I'm going, you know, I know I got to pray in church, so I'm going to go right here with you. So we got two things happening here. Either the boy has not taken a shower in 18 months, <laughs> He went out, bought some drugs, wrote it on his leg, went home, showered, dang! Went out, bought some drugs, <laughs> wrote it on his leg, went home, showered, uh, dang! <laughs> Additional investigation led to no corroborating proof when the police arrested those 46 people and vigorously searched their homes and possessions, no drugs were found, nor were weapons, money, paraphernalia, or any other indications at all that the housewife, pig farmer, or anyone else arrested 
were actually drug kingpins. What was discovered was judicial misconduct running rampant in the war on drugs in Tulia, Texas, with a clear racial bias. Coleman had accused 10% of Tulia's black population of dealing in cocaine. Based on his word alone, 50% of all of the black men in town were indicted, convicted, and sentenced to prison. Randy Credico of the William Mosley's Counselor Fund called Tulia a mass lynching, taking down 50% of the male adult black population like that. It's outrageous. It's like being accused of raping someone in Indiana in the 1930s. You didn't do it, but it doesn't matter because a bunch of Klansmen on the jury are gonna string you up anyway. But this wasn't 1930. It was the beginning of the 21st century with a powerful civil rights movement that had bridged those two eras. But the war on drugs really, really did its damage to the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65, as designed. The next piece that I'm going to read deals with respectability and Barack Obama. Black respectability, or appropriate behavior, doesn't seem to matter. If anything, black achievement, black aspirations, and black success are construed as direct threats, Obama's presidency made that clear. Aspirations and their achievement provide no protection, not even to the God-fearing. On June 17, 2015, South Carolinian Dylan Roof, a white, unemployed, 21-year-old high school dropout, was on a mission to take his country back. Ever since George Zimmerman had walked out of the courthouse a free man after killing Trayvon Martin, and a racially polarized nation debated the verdict, Roof had looked to understand the history of America. Trolling through the internet, he stumbled across the Council of Conservative Citizens, the Tri-C, the progeny of the 1950s White Citizens Council that had terrorized black people, closed schools, and worked hand in hand with state governments to defy federal civil rights laws. Despite the group's avowed racist belief system in the mid to the late 1990s, the group boasted of having 34 members who were in the Mississippi legislature, including then Senate Majority Leader Trent Lott. By 2004, Mississippi Governor Haley Barber, chair of the Republican National Committee, and 37 other powerful uh, politicians had all attended Tri-C events in the 21st century. Earl Holt III, who was chair of the uh, Tri-C, gave $65,000 to Republican campaign funds in recent years, including donations to the 26th presidential campaign of Rand Paul, Rick Santorum, and Ted Cruz. The Tri-C then enjoyed precisely the cachet of respectability that racism requires to achieve its own goals within American society. And its website of hatred and lies provided the self-serving education Dylan Roof so desperately craved. He drank in the poison of his message, got into his car, drove to Charleston, entered Emmanuel AME Church and landed in a Bible study with a group of African Americans who were the very model of respectability. Ruth prayed with them, read the Bible with them, thought they were so nice. Lord. Then he shot them dead, leaving just one woman alive so that she could tell the world what he had done and why. Yet taking over our country, he said, and he knew this to be true. Well, not even a full month after Dylan Roof gunned down nine African Americans at Emanuel AME, Republican presidential frontrunner Donald Trump fired up his silent majority audience of thousands in July 2015 with a macabre promise. Don't worry, we'll take our country back. No, it's time instead that we take our country forward 
into the future, a better future. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, I've got a new book coming out. <laughs> For just a couple of questions. Okay. So, um, John is on the other side. So, if there's someone in the audience with a question, please raise your hand and we'll try to get to you. Uh, hi, I'm. Gotcha. Hello. <laughs> uh, first off, thank you so much for coming to speak to us um, and all of your inspiring and thoughtful words. I am a grad student with the background in history and international relations. And as we see uh, more of these far right movements of white nationalism taking place in European countries as well as here. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know if you could point to a single um, cause or, or even factor that's common in white rage internationally as well as in just America. Wow. Thank you. So you know my, I'm a diplomatic historian, right? <laughs> it was a nice setup, wasn't it? Okay. Um, I think one of the, the key elements, um, just like the, the element in the US, just as the element in um, Europe, has been the increasing diversity of those areas. And this feeling, because this is one of the mechanisms of white rage, is a narrative of a zero-sum game. That the only way that anyone else can get will be at white's expense. You know, so if I get, it's going to be at your expense. If you get, it's going to be that zero-sum game. It's a false narrative. But it is a narrative that has been plied over and over and over by very ruthless, power-hungry politicians who know that it works. Because all you have to say, so let me give you an example. And because in, after the election, Vox did uh, an interview in Kentucky, I think it was Whitley, Kentucky, where 62% of the people were on Obamacare and 80% voted for Trump. And so the reporters started asking about what difference has access to health insurance made for you? Has it had any kind of impact on the quality of your life? And they were like, oh my gosh, my husband's going to get a liver transplant. A liver transplant. And another one was talking about, I finally have my diabetes under control because I'm able to go see the doctor regularly. I, I mean, so, you know, they're talking about, these, these aren't, aren't small things. This is like life stuff. Um, and as they're talking about it, the, the, then the reporter said, well, you know, um, you voted for Trump. They're like, yeah. And they're like, but you know they're going to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. Oh, I heard them, but they don't mean that. <laughs> well, you know that the Republicans in Congress voted nearly 60 times to try to dismantle the, stop, you're scaring me. And then comes the zero-sum game. Yeah, but you know, my premiums are going up. And there are those people who have better health insurance than I do, and they don't deserve it. You can, your husband's getting ready to get a liver transplant. 
and, who, and those people are getting something that you rightfully believe you deserve and they do not. And that what they're getting is at your expense. That zero sum game is powerful. We hear it, we hear, we heard it in um, California when Pete Wilson floated Pop, uh, um, Prop 187 that said about ensuring that immigrants, children did not have access to health care or to education because it was costing us. The only way those immigrants could get would be at our expense. This is the same kind of rhetoric you're hearing in Europe. This is the rhetoric you're hearing in the United States. Divide and conquer is powerful. Zero sum game is powerful. We have got to be aware of that so that we can begin to diffuse the power of white rage. White rage is absolutely destructive. It is destructive. It is destructive to our democracy. It is destructive to our educational system. It is destructive, but it works politically because we don't think in those terms. So that, that as I see it, is, is what's going on. I mean, even a place like Denmark, um, during the Second World War, Denmark protected 93% of its Jewish population. Think about that. The king, you know, and Denmark is occupied by the Nazis. And the king would not bow down. And they had worked out a system that when the Nazis looked like they were going to get too intense, you know, think about that, Nazis getting too intense. <laughs> uh, but they had triggers, warnings for this. And so they had worked out a system where they were ferrying people into the hospital to look like they were patients. They were actually Jews that they were then getting out of the country via a series of fisher, uh, uh, fishing boats. Protected 93%. But right now in Denmark, you have the rise of a right-wing fascist group and a lot of racial hatred coursing through that society because you play on people's fears. White rage requires that you prey on people's fears about what's going to happen to their home, their well-being, their way of life. It's, it's standard textbook. Professor Anderson, um, again, I'm up here. Gotcha. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, again, thank you very much. You. Um, early in your presentation, you said that white rage is the reaction to African American achievement. Mm -hmm. And much of what you've said since then modified that. But I think that gives white rage too much of a rational character. I wonder very much whether in the, a I mean, in the absence of achievement, to the extent that us white people have tried to keep achievement absent, whether white rage isn't still uh, as furious I'm having trouble believing in the rationality of what you imply. Because it's frightening. Because we expect racism to wear a sheet. We expect it to burn a cross. We expect it to look like Charlottesville. That's the kind of racism we know how to handle. That's the kind of racism we know how to point a finger to. That's the kind of racism we know to go, mm. But what do you do when it's sitting there on the Supreme Court? What do you do when it's in the governor's mansion? What do you do when it's on the school board? And so, the rationality, let me kind of walk you through the book. Coming at, after the end of the Civil War, 
you have a major advancement for African Americans. They are no longer property. Wow. They are human beings. Legal human beings. That is huge. Then, with the 14th Amendment and the 15th Citizens, the response to that was intense. Yes, there's the violence, but there is the violence that has been sanctioned and okayed without consequences by a political and legal system. And there are a series of Supreme Court decisions that systematically undermine the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, and the 15th Amendment. This is why we have to have a civil rights movement in the United States in the middle of the 20th century after the US has defeated the Nazis. Because there's all of this work that was undone after the Civil War because black people were citizens. And a series of policies were now coming through to strip that freedom and strip that citizenship from them. The Great Migration, the next chapter. Here, Isabel Wilkerson talks about it as being, this is the first step that the servant class ever took without asking. Mm. Oh, she can write. <laughs> mm. And here you have this mass movement, 10% of the black population fleeing out of the South. The South's response, yeah, you had some violence also sanctioned by the powers that be. But you had legislation coming through, like laws in Jacksonville, forbidding African Americans from leaving the city to find a better job. I'm telling you, right? Now, now imagine that in this capitalist economy, one of the things that we understand in America is that you will move for a better job. Imagine a law, a law. So this isn't the Klan writing this law. This is the city council and signed off by the mayor and enforced by the police that when black people are at the train station, arresting them for vagrancy, convicting them of vagrancy, and then auctioning off their labor to the nearest plantation owner. They were stopping trains during the First World War. I mean, you know, trains are absolutely essential for being able to move war material and personnel. And you know, train schedules are really tight. They were stopping trains in Mississippi to ensure that black people did not leave. This is, again, not the Klan. So as black people are claiming their own sense of self-determination, the response was no. And when they went north, because the north is not the promised land. I think I'm going to say that one again. <laughs> yeah. They ran into redlining. They ran into massive discrimination in services and employment you know, where you've got a two-tiered union system coming out of the plants out of, um, uh, in Detroit, Pittsburgh. Exactly. Yes, that's the man. He just said exactly, so I know I'm on it. <laughs> so you get these structures, and this is part of what is hard for us to wrestle with. When I talk about Brown, yes, again, we see the Klan. But when we get over 101 US senators and congressional representatives signing a manifesto saying they will use every lever of power that they have to stop Brown from being implemented, to stop black children from getting access to a quality education. And let's be clear, Plessy v. Ferguson of 1896 says separate but equal. The states were able to understand that larger word separate. Equal, 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 equal. <laughs> That word befuddled them. 
And so they implemented separate with a quickness. Again, this is the system that is doing it. This is, you know, you, there are laws on the books about separate Bibles when you're swearing in in court. You know, separate dog cemeteries. Separate Coke machines. It, just, just separate. Brown, when it was supposed to break Jim Crow, the response from the system gave legitimacy to the violence, but it also created its own dynamic and systematically, quietly undermining the implementation of anything that could really look like true equality. So that's why we've got the Kerner Commission report 50 years later that is noting the systemic inequality in terms of wealth, in terms of segregation, that still haunts black America in 2018. And when you think about the election of Barack Obama, It was a scandal-free administration. He inherited an economic system that was on the verge of collapse. He had an absolutely recalcitrant Congress that said its job was to ensure that he was a one-term president. And the response, and I, I've heard, well, how racist can America be? How can this really be? Because Obama was elected twice. Have we heard that? But in, neither in 2008 nor in 2012 did the majority of whites who voted vote for Obama. And that is why when we're looking at the 2016 election, what we see is that the only candidate that the majority of whites voted for, who voted, voted for Trump. There is something going on in this system. And so part of what has to happen, and that's one of the reasons I wrote the book, is so that we can begin to have the real conversation, not these sound bites that we're used to, but that we can get into the, the book, I think a third of the book, footnotes, so that we are having an evidence-based discussion about how we got here. Dr. Anderson, and I know that there are probably 20 hands in the audience that would love to ask a question now. Uh, and I would love to listen to you for, uh, for quite a bit more time. I can tell that you are deeply engaged and I always love when we have historians who come because in reading your book, and I will say that there are over 80, 80 individuals within our community who read your book um, as a part of conversations during MLK that in reading your book, it was page after page of history that we did not, even for the most experienced, did not know. Yeah. And as a part of the narrative, we just say to you, thank you for coming here thank you. and engaging with us. In a power, I've been getting texts from individuals actually, <laughs> um, saying how much that I had to leave, but this was amazing. Wow. We have to say, thank you, but you're always welcome. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So at this time, let's, let's thank her once thank again. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. I, I forgot to mention our sponsors, so it's very important for me to mention our sponsors. The Office of the President, Cause, Dr. Trotter, always thank, thank you, you for being faithful in terms of this. Tim Haggerty and the Humanities, um, Humanities Scholars Program has been a vital part of this, and 
our Center for Student Diversity and Inclusion, yes. I just have to say, phenomenal uh, in their support of the efforts. I have to do shameless plugs, okay, before you leave out. Shameless plugs because the International Film Festival is happening. This is week two. There are, have, the theme is Faces of Inequality. There have been some powerful, powerful film screenings happening on our campus. If you can find the time, please look that up. Come view, sit in audiences, and engage. And for students in the audience, because my, co my colleague and friend here, Holly Hippen, still is here, and in our rotation, the, the Carnegie Mellon Student Experience <laughs> Survey has pressed, check your email. Please, please, please go there, students, graduate students, undergraduate students, and take that survey because it helps to inform our campus culture and climate. And it's something in which we take very seriously. Your opinion matters. And the more that we can engage in these meaningful conversations, I think the better we can be as citizens of the Carnegie Mellon community and beyond. Thank you again. Lovely. Have a good evening.